Kia ora, everybody. We're going to start in about a minute. So hopefully, um, if you're waiting to come on for the webinar, please do so because we'll be starting very shortly. Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Kia ora, everybody. It's Sheila Murray here, Director of Development and Alumni. Welcome you to the last of our webinars in the series March with Otago, put on by the Alumni and Development Office here at Otago. Um, we're very excited to have tonight Professor Cliff Abraham, um, and it's certainly a great pleasure to welcome him to the um, do his presentation. So just a few um uh, mechanical uh, rules if you like them. Um, if you want to ask a question at the end of the presentation, please do so in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, and we will then endeavour to ask um, your question um, at the end of Cliff's presentation. We are hoping to go for an hour but if there's a lot of interest um, we may go a bit longer but certainly we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, so um, as I mentioned, um, welcome. Uh, lovely to see you all um, registered here on, on, on this um, presentation tonight. Um, Cliff is um, presenting on Alzheimer's disease challenge and hope. And Professor Cliff Abraham is, has research interests in the neural mechanisms of memory. He has played a leading role in promoting neuroscience research and teaching at the University of Otago and nationally. In 1997, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand, and in 2007, he was awarded a James Cook Fellowship. He was awarded the University of Otago's Distinguished Research Medal in 2009 and the Division of Sciences Research of the Year in 2018. Currently, he is director of a major HRC-funded research program investing bio, investigating biomarkers and therapeutic agents for Alzheimer's disease. He has played a leading role in promoting neuroscience research and teaching at the University of Otago and nationally, and is currently co-leader of the National Aotearoa Brain Project, Kopapa Rora o Aotearoa. After completing his PhD in neuroscience from the University of Florida, um, he took five years of postdoctoral research at the University of Otago and the University of Gothenburg, Sweden, before taking up a role here in psychology at the University of Otago. So welcome, Professor Abraham, and we look forward to hearing from you tonight. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sheila. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, yes, so as, as Sheila mentioned, um, I've been at the university for a long time, um, over 40 years. So there must be something here that I like. And um, I like the cherry blossom. Um, and I work in a really great department, the Department of Psychology, uh, which I could wax on for a long time. But equally, um, uh, and one of the real appeals of being here is that there's a great collegial network of neuroscientists uh, working across the university in the medical school and in the, in the sciences and um, held together with, by glue with, uh, by the Brain Health Research Center, with the logo of which you can see here, which is currently directed by Professor, Professor Stephanie Hughes. Uh, but um, you'll see from this talk that uh, my own work has benefited a lot by collaborating with, um, with my colleagues um, around the university in different departments. 
But I also just want to point out the Altero Brain Project that um, Sheila's mentioned because um, I'm a co-director of that at the moment, um, helped set it up. And um, we've just launched a, a little while ago, uh, which aims to actually serve that same glue role, networking role and promotion of neuroscience research across the country uh, to improve, uh, find ways to improve brain health uh, for everyone in New Zealand, reduce inequities, and just get the research going further and faster and better. So uh, we're really uh, looking forward to an exciting journey with the um, Aotearoa Brain Project. So I'd like to start with, um, next slide if I can get it. There, uh, that looks like a tunnel. Uh, and yes, actually, indeed it is a tunnel. Um, and the reason I have it there is because it's supposed to represent life's journey which I know very well is not a straight road. There's lots of forks in the road and different pathways that you take by chance or by accident, like me coming to New Zealand. Um, and you sort of loop, loop around and you go different directions. But in the end, we're hoping as life goes on that we can reach those golden years in good shape with good brain health. And we'll, we're able to enjoy those years um, with our family and friends. But of course, one of the key things there is that we need good brain health to reach that objective. So I get to talk about my favorite subject here, which is the brain. And um, here we are looking at a human brain, a picture of a human brain uh, from a top-down view with the front of the brain here at the top of the screen, back to the brain here. And you can see actually, well, you may or may not know, but this is a very healthy looking brain, nice fat gyre, very narrow, uh, gaps between them. If you uh, had a plant analogy, I would call this a cauliflower. So very, um, very tight connection or uh, tight groupings of um, all this uh, cortical uh, mass of tissue. Now, if you, um, but that's not the best part in a way, because you can, you slice the brain down the middle and then turn it sideways. If you can see it fits in the palm of your hand and there's very intricate structures um, inside the brain that you can't see just from the outside looking in. Uh, too many to go into here, but you know, here's another little cauliflower looking like structure called the cerebellum um, and lots of interesting, important um, groupings of nerve cells and nuclei and so forth that we, as we call them, um, that uh, coordinate with the cortex to drive cognition in all our, all our behaviors. And this brain is only um, about a, one and a half or so kilograms. So it's only about 2% of body weight, but it uses 20% of the cardiac output. So it's very hungry and thirsty. It needs lots of you know, uh, nutrition and it needs lots of oxygen and it's a very busy uh, organ. And so uh, it takes, as I say, 20% of the output. So if we look inside, there's of course, lots of nerve cells. And here's just a diagram of a, of a stain that's stained just a few of them. There aren't really lots of gaps between them. It's, there's lots and lots of cells in here. You just can't see them all with this picture. And in fact, the human brain is made up of about a hundred billion nerve cells. And if you think about the connections between them, that's about you know, 10,000 times that number. So there's a lot of processing power and a lot of cells. It's a very highly coordinated society of cells that work together to produce our behavioral outputs, our emotions, our thoughts, our movements, um, and so forth, and memories, of course. Now, in addition to those nerve cells, we have what I like to call the brain's guardians. And these are cells that are in the brain, but they're not nerve cells, they're non-neural cells. Um, and we have represented here on the left, we have astrocytes labeled in red. They're called astrocytes because they sort of look like star-shaped cells with processes coming out from around a central center. And um, they play a very important support role um, and communicate with neurons to enhance their uh, efficiency and uh, productivity and also help keep them healthy. And on the right is another kind of uh, guardian cell called uh, microglia. So um, they have very spidery looking processes, thin processes coming out. There's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. You can see that they're 
uh, many, many microglia around as well. They are the resident immune cell um, inside uh, the brain. And they serve a lot of um, cleanup functions, as do the astrocytes to a certain extent, to uh, remove damaged, damaged uh, debris and um, uh, material, um, in, uh, uh, microbes maybe, and, and other infectious um, things coming into the brain. So basically they're really on the constant surveillance of the tissue and they can actually move. It's kind of creepy to think about these things creeping through your brain, but they can move to the sites of disorder and surround them and try to eliminate them by engulfing uh, abnormal material. So these are very important parts of the process as well. And there's as many, actually way, probably way more of these kinds of non-neural cells as there are the actual uh, nerve cells, which indicates how important they are for normal brain function. Now the other guardian is um, what we call the blood-brain barrier. So now we're looking at a capillary here um, on sort of end on. So there'll be of course blood will be coming into the brain and material is going to be getting into the brain from the blood supply, but only certain material because the blood vessels are encapsulated by different cell types, endothelial cells, pericytes, astrocytes and cells and so forth so that only certain things are allowed out of the bloodstream into the brain, because there's lots of things in here in the blood supply that would actually be damaging to brain function. So it's very important to only transport in the things that are, that are needed and not the things that would be damaging. So this is the third level of protection that the brain has. Okay, well, here's the challenge. We've been talking about Alzheimer's disease and Really what happens there is that this tunnel that we're, or this roadway that we're trying to take to the golden years um, becomes blocked and interrupted and difficult to get through. And it's kind of, look, this is kind of symbolic of the disease because disease is characterized by accumulations of material that get in the way of nerve cell function as well, not just kind of in the way of the pathway. And this is the challenge that's represented by actually not just Alzheimer's disease, but many other aging related neurological disorders, Parkinson's disease, Lewis disease, frontotemporal dementia and so forth. So this is the challenge. And obviously it's a difficult challenge because people have been studying Alzheimer's disease in ways to kind of treat it for decades. And we're only just beginning to make some progress, but at least that's a positive thing and you'll be hearing a little bit about it a little later. So Alzheimer's disease um, is the best known and most widely found form of dementia. So dementia is kind of a catch-all term for many diseases, but all, Alzheimer's disease makes up 50 to 70% of cases. So it's a very severe problem. As I think everyone knows, I don't think I need to describe the symptoms because they're very commonly known we begin with memory disorders, but progress to all facets of brain function and eventually ending in death. So a normal healthy brain by the end stage begins to look like this. And just by looking, you can tell this is not very healthy now. It's not the nice cauliflower shape, but the, the, gy the gyri as they're called have become much uh, thinner and the gaps between them are fissures. They look like um, you know, big cavities, caverns, um, that are, are, are developing between the gyri. And this is basically just because so much brain tissue has been lost. So many cells have died off. So it's no surprise that brain function is completely compromised when you get to this stage. And what we know about the pathology is that um, there's accumulation of different kinds of proteins that get into the way that sort of block the tunnel get in the way of normal nerve cell, nerve cell function and it can actually kill them off. So for example, up here are examples of tissue stained for what are called amyloid plaques made up of a small uh, piece of protein uh, or short peptide called um, amyloid. And they gather at, in, in uh, clumps that, that are kind of insoluble and, are very, and difficult even for the guardian cells to get rid of. So they develop and accumulate more and more. Here's a close-up of one such plaque. 
The other thing that accumulates um, is, is inside the cell called tangles made up of a different protein called tau, which gets into a um, dysfunctional form. And they start, start to aggregate into insoluble um, forms as well. They build up inside a cell and eventually kill that cell off here, as you can sort of see in this case. So these are pro this is basically a protein aggregation disease. And in fact, many of the neurologic um, degenerative neurological disorders of various kinds are protein aggregation disorders, but involve maybe different proteins and aggregating in different parts of the brain to give the different disease phenotypes. So um, it is the uh, really post-mortem analysis of brains, looking at these aggregates that really help us define whether a person has Alzheimer's disease. People may be diagnosed as probable Alzheimer's disease uh, while they're living, um, but it's based on educated guess, based on the inf clinical information available, but really it takes formal post-mortem pathological analyses to confirm for sure. And of course, this is not often done because in the end there's probably no need to, unless for research purposes. Now, part of the problem with the Alzheimer's disease is that as these aggregates form and cells die off, these brain guardian cells get activated. So the astrocytes uh, become, uh, hy become hypertrophy. They get expanded processes. They get fat and thick. They can, look, they can, they can just look activated, look angry um, as they're trying to deal with the uh, disturbed tissue around them. And also the microglia over here uh, lose their spidery processes and they, they form more globular structures as they moved around to the site of disorder, trying to um, engulf the, the dead and dying material. So this is a form of neuroinflammation as we call it. And, um, and normally you, you would, as you know about inflammation generally, this is a good thing. This is part of the body's natural reaction to damage anywhere. Whether you sprain your ankle, break an, break an arm, you will get inflammation they, to, to deal with the problem and eventually gets fixed and the inflammation dies down. But because these are insoluble plaques and tangles, the, 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 the triggers for the uh, inflammatory response never go away. And then the fact that these cells remain activated, releasing their chemicals that are supposed to help with the inflammation, but if released, an, maintained over a long period of time causes damage actually. So we get additional damage to the brain because these immune cells are no longer uh, working as, as best they can. And what's more, the blood-brain barrier, because of these uh, neuroinflammatory responses become leaky and things that are not supposed to be in the brain start getting into the brain from, from the blood supply as well. So it's just a kind of a negative spiral of events um, that just make the situation in the brain worse and worse all the time. So what are the big issues in terms of dealing with the disease? First of all, we would like to actually prevent it, obviously. And if not prevent it, we'd like to delay the onset so that people have a good quality of life for as long as possible. Second of all, we'd like to actually be able to detect the disease early. And that's very important because the earlier you can detect it, the more effective treatments are likely to be. And finally, we actually need to have effective treatments. And that's been a major um, issue because uh, we're still walking around the edges of this. Um, and that's one of the major challenges. There are some treatments currently approved, um, but again, they generally only come online after clinical diagnosis which means that already the brain has suffered a lot of damage. So if we can just get it to happen earlier, if we get the early detection going, then some of these treatments might actually be more effective, and, but it's still probably even still need new treatments. Okay, so for prevention or delay, it's basically the old adage, adage I'm sure you've all heard, use it or lose it. Not use or it or lose it, but use it or lose it. So, um, so just like muscles, the muscles are more functional, you might say, healthier if you use them than if you don't use them and they atrophy. Brain is very similar. So the things that you can do to help 
delay at least the onset of degenerative diseases and Alzheimer's disease is to use your brain and to keep it in a healthy environment of healthy body environment. So good diet, good exercise, good social connections, um, keeping your weight within a, a normal limit is good because obesity is also associated with inflammation in the brain. I'm not sure about writing checkbooks. I mean, that checks, that's not really um, something you can do anymore, but I like to think of it as going shopping. So I heard someone say that actually going shopping is good for you. You get a bit of exercise walking around, you use your brain looking for your bargains, you do it socially, um, and you probably have a good healthy lunch while you're doing it. So um, maybe you should go shopping. If you're a smoker, actually the best thing you can do is stop smoking. So these are things that, that you can do in your own life um, to delay at least the onset of neurological, many neurological disorders and also other, other um, uh, issues uh, or health issues in the rest of your body for that matter um, by following some of these simple guidelines. Now, what about early detection? Well, basically early detection has been almost impossible because the disease actually can start 10, 15, 20 years before actual clinical diagnosis. And we've already come to realize this through um, longitudinal studies over some period of time. But with the emergence of some modern technologies like um, so-called PET scans, where you inject a little bit of a radioactive tracer that can bind onto the amyloid plaques, there is this technique then that can be used to determine whether a person's brain has developing Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, these kinds of scans are expensive. They're not able to be done most places in the country or the world, only in a few centers that have these PET scan scanning techniques. And so it's not really a, really avail readily available for the many, many people who have potentially um, Alzheimer's disease developing their brains. We need something better, although it is a tool in the toolkit, should uh, clinicians feel the need to uh, check it out. So what, we're, what we've been doing here at the University of Otago through a, a, a collaboration um, funded by the Health Research Council beginning some more than 10 years ago now um, and led by Associate Professor Joanna Williams in the anatomy department and with some other uh, important colleagues to this effort, including um, Deanne Guevremont, uh, who's been doing a lot of the hands-on work in the lab and uh, Professor Warren Tate, biochemistry, and Nick Cutfield, who's a um, neurologist in the med school. So um, we've been studying the, pot the potential of a blood test for early stage Alzheimer's disease, looking at a particular molecule called microRNA, tiny strands of RNA, which um, can escape out of cells and even out of the brain into the blood supply. Um, and can be measured in plasma samples that you take from uh, patients or uh, study participants. And our group has found that um, actually it only takes measuring of a couple uh, microRNA in the blood supply to give a very sensitive indicator of whether someone has um, uh, early, onset, uh, early uh, signs of Alzheimer's disease with 86 percent specificity and 80 percent sensitivity, which means that there's a very high likelihood of detecting someone who has it and also a very likely, very high likelihood of re, um, saying that someone who doesn't have the disease, they, they don't actually have it. So this is a very promising um, test um, that we're, we're working to, um, uh, based on samples we collected here in Dunedin actually, but also from samples that have been obtained overseas from Australia and the USA. And um, we're trying to interest um, drug companies in um, helping uh, progress this research to a, to a scale where we can um, do this um, in much larger populations and hopefully roll it out as some kind of test in, in the not too distant future. And for that purpose, um, working with Otago Innovation, we've gotten, again, led by Joanna, uh, gotten a provisional patent here in New Zealand. Um, that we are now working to progress to later stages. So this is our new hope that's come just out of research here at the University of Otago. 
um, through um, a dedicated uh, interest in this early detection um, issue. I want to give out a shout out to the University of Otago Foundation Trust because there was a time uh, when the funding was running out from the HRC Health Research Council, and we were needed to keep the uh, research going. And people kindly donated towards this blood test um, research effort through the University of Otago Foundation Trust and helped us keep it going. Um, and so we're immensely, if you're one of those, we're immensely grateful to you for your um, support. Now, what about treatment? This has been the bugbear really for decades, trying to find something that will actually work against the disease. And again, so the question is, is this all challenge or is there still uh, now new hope? So what does it take to get a good treatment? Well, here's a list of, uh, you know, sort of a shopping list of things that we'd like to see in a treatment. First of all, of course, it needs to be effective. It'd be nice if it's long lasting, so you didn't have to keep taking the treatment over and over again, daily or weekly or monthly. It'd be, you want it to be non-invasive. You don't want to have to open up the skull and inject things into the brain through neurosurgery, which is not, which is not practical, of course, and has lots of risks anyway. Um, you want to deliver it to the whole brain because the disease in the end gets to the whole brain. You want it to, so that means you're probably going to be in, uh, taking it orally or injecting something in the periphery in order to use the blood supply to take your treatment to the whole brain. And that will mean that you have your treatment has to get across that blood brain barrier that I've just been telling you about. And of course you want few if any side effects and it should be affordable. So uh, it's a long wish list and it may be difficult to hit um, all the targets, but th this is the sort of thing that we're looking for. So as I mentioned, people have been um, studying this. Th these aren't our people. These are just random people pictured off the internet, but people have been working at this, um, like I say, for a long time trying to find ways forward. And there's lots of strategies for this. You might have antibodies to those toxic proteins that can bind to them and take them out of the system. Or you might develop drugs that inhibit the enzymes that make those toxic proteins. You might have drugs that to attack the neuroinflammation response. And potentially you might be able to actually repurpose drugs already in use for something else. So there's lots of strategies. And um, there has been some progress on the antibody front. So you may have heard the news in the recent, over the last, nine, 12 months that two new drugs have been approved by the FDA in the US, the Food and Drug Administration for treatment of Alzheimer's disease, um, Aduhelm and also Lecanemab more recently. And although they've been approved, it, they've been really approved more on a wish and a, and a prayer than um, hard scientific evidence that they can actually manage all those, um, uh, fit all those, uh, target points that I've just mentioned to you for treatment, and particularly effectiveness. So they have some sign of being effective, but not a huge effect and not for all that much longer than normal. And they come with potential side effects that can be quite serious. So um, although they've been approved, I'm sure people will be lining up to get them. They'll be expensive. And uh, whether they'll be you know, good value for money in the end is still questionable. But it is a step forward from where we have been. So I think there's reason to be grateful that there's this kind of work going on. But we're taking another approach and that is, um, we want to talk about maybe producing more positively acting proteins in the brain. And we're taking our clue here from the so-called uh, NUN study. I don't know if you've heard of the NUN study. It's a fairly old study now, but um, quite some time ago, researchers decided to study 678 American members of the School Sisters of Notre Dame across the USA, uh, beginning in Minnesota, where the study, study research was actually located. So these uh, women were, uh, at the time of study, were 75 to 106 years old. And they were chosen because they, live, they lived a fairly um, parallel and consistent lives in terms of their environmental exposures, their diet, probably their level of exercise, their interactions with other people. So it removes a lot of variability that you might just get from the general public, uh, uh, population. 
an interesting thing is they, you know, there's masses of data that are, were collected about them. And one of the things that was collected was uh, that the researchers had ex access to was the autobiographical essays that the young women wrote when they, when they uh, applied to join the order in their early 20s. And what the researchers found was that those who had very high density writing in their, in their essays were much less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease in their old age compared to those who had very low linguistic density in their essays. So that gives a sign that maybe education or some other factors associated with good brain um, performance might, re might give some resilience uh, to the uh, effects of um, uh, the possible Alzheimer's disease uh, developing. And one of the really interesting things was that even for those women who had very good brain function um, in their later life, many of them actually had brains that were populated quite a lot with those amyloid plaques I was telling you about. So they had the pathological signs of disease, but they didn't have the cognitive dysfunction and impairment. Again, suggesting that they had some kind of resilience to the pathology, even though that it was already developing in the brain. So they were able to live longer with better lives, um, despite the um, insidious pathology that was developing. So that gave us hope that we can target uh, brain resilience and building what is called cognitive reserve um, to promote a longer and better life. So the idea here is that a person with low reserve, as the pathology develops, tips over into cognitive decline and dementia sooner than a, a person with high cognitive reserve who may tip over a bit later at, at a later stage of pathology and takes longer to le reach that dementia stage before eventually succumbing. So we've been working on this idea that we should try to increase, increase the amount of a particular therapeutic neuroprotective protein in the brain that we've been working on actually to, to, uh, with this kind of aim in mind for the last 20 years or so. But uh, the problem, of course, is that how do you get a neuroprotective protein increased in the brain? And if you're just going to kind of uh, give it as a, like a drug to a person, how are you gonna get that across the blood-brain barrier? because proteins don't like to cross the blood-brain barrier. So that's a significant issue in trying to develop a treatment out of a possible therapeutic protein. So here's the solution. And that is to try to um, harness the gene therapy approach to produce a long-term fix to uh, problems in the brain. So how does that work? Well, you begin with a virus. Now, this may sound very counterintuitive, having been in the being in the middle of a pandemic or the back end of a pandemic where we've all learned a little bit about viruses and how bad they are and how they have spike proteins that get the viruses into the cells and of course the vir viruses replicate they end up destroying cells and destroying function because they've been so sort of, um, hyper um, kind of uh, re reproduced inside the cell but the thing is you can you can harness this you can take advantage of what we call the virus envelope or the virus capsid. You can take out the DNA, the harmful DNA that's in the virus, and you can put into the virus envelope the DNA that you do want to be there, then that you want to go into cells and be reproduced there and let the cell's own machinery make more of this therapeutic protein that you're trying to, um, trying to amplify into the tissue. So this is a very common technique now, both research, and it's been also now being looked at more and more in terms of therapy for all kinds of uh, disorders where uh, adding, getting therapeutic genes into cells may be helpful. So, um, so we've taken this approach as well. And um, we started by uh, intracranial injections into animals modeling um, Alzheimer's disease into the brain region called the hippocampus, which is one of the areas of the brain that is uh, impaired quite early in the Alzheimer's disease process and um, is associated with memory deficits like spatial memory deficits and, and so forth. So it's a, it's a good uh, target as a, for a proof of principle study that maybe this kind of approach might be helpful. 
So to do this, I joined up with the virus and gene therapy expert at University Professor Stephanie Hughes in the biochemistry department. Again, working with our team members, Lucy and Bruce, and also again, our guru, Warren Tate in biochemistry. We brought in a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease where they've been given um, human genes associated with the familiar form of, of Alzheimer's disease. Here's the showing in the hippocampus, lots of plaques, amyloid plaques that are shown in the brain. And um, so researchers in our labs, uh, especially noting here, Connie Chan, who is a master's student, was looking in um, as one measure, the ability of the brain to produce neurogenesis as adult mice. In other words, build new cells, generate new brain cells, nerve cells in the brain. And you can see in the control mice, there's a certain amount of, um, and each dot is actually the data from a single mouse. You can see that compared to the um, control mice, the Alzheimer's mice have a much lower rate of neurogenesis um, compared to the controls. Now, if we inject uh, a single injection at, um, in this case, nine months of age, and then study three or four months later, you can see that this ability to produce nerve cells is almost completely rescued by giving uh, the virus with the therapy protein um, into the tail vein, so then just circulates through the body and into the brain, and it, uh, it let its ability to, uh, able to rescue um, this neurogenesis function. And perhaps more importantly, it was also able to rescue neuro, um, a memory deficit uh, as shown by Bella Tan during her PhD studies. So this is a, what we call a water maze where the animals have to swim around and navigate around in a pool of water to find a submerged platform where they could rest on. And um, using the cues around the room, they can eventually go um, uh, faster and with a shorter swimming uh, distance to get to that submerged platform. The Alzheimer's mice are very poor at this task, but when they're given the gene therapy into the hippocampus, they're just about back at control levels. So that was very promising results um, from that study. But of course, we're not wanting to inject in the brain. We want to actually, um, I, I said inject the tail vein. We actually injected in the, in the brain for these uh, particular studies. So now we, that was proof of principle that gene therapy might work over a period of time. Now we need to be able to do it in the periphery. So this involves, in this case, for these mice injecting into the tail vein. And uh, we had to find, uh, well, we had the problem that these viruses we're working with didn't cross the blood brain barrier either. But more recently we found um, there have been developed versions of these virus envelopes that is able to actually get across the blood brain barrier and into, um, uh, into the cells. So we took advantage of one of those and did a study um, beginning with Sophie Na Matheson during her PhD and then Emily who's just did her own PhD, looking at the ability of the peripheral gene therapy with this therapeutic protein to rescue um, uh, the disease in these mice. And if we look at the, uh, the amount of area that's covered with plaques in a six month old mouse compared to a nine month old mouse, you can see that the plaque area increases quite dramatically over that three month period. But the mice that have been given the gene therapy have a much lower rate of plaque development compared to um, uh, the untreated mice. That's in the hippocampus. And if you look in the cerebral cortex, we see the same kind of trend where there's the increase in plaque uh, load in the uh, nine month old mice compared to six month. And that's basically completely stop stopped by the, um, the mice that have been treated um, with the uh, gene therapy. So um, this looks promising. Um, Still, this particular virus, although it can cross the blood-brain barrier, doesn't do it in primates. So now if we're gonna think about humans, we need to find a, a, a virus envelope that can cross the blood-brain barrier in primates. One of those has now been developed. And so we've just started a full trial uh, using this um, new virus capsid um, to kind of um, see if we can get um, all these bits and pieces put together from these preliminary studies, behavioral improvement, plaque improvement, uh, reduced neuroinflammation, um, brain plasticity rescue, and so forth. So the hope is then that more neuroprotective proteins in the brain um, will give more brain resilience, more cognitive reserve, reduce pathology, and reduce. So we think we're on a good track. And um, 
yeah, we're going to keep working on this, see how far we can get. So to conclude, basically, with what you can do and what we can do, we, and working together, we want to be able to add life to years. And I think we want to get to that, that golden stage where uh, we have an enjoyable later um, part of our lives with good green health. So I want to thank all the, the funders, um, particularly the HRC Health Research Council and Brain Research New Zealand Center of Research Excellence when it was when it was around. So your tax dollars were helping with that, but also those of you who have been donating to the Neurological Foundation, Antarctical Medical Research Foundation have also helped in supporting parts of our work. And also, again, uh, I just want to thank the University of Otago Foundation Trust um, for the people who have donated to the particularly the, um, the blood test work um, that's been ongoing. And I just want to say, oh, and also I want to thank people here, some of them, not all of the team, but here's some. Uh, we did give ourselves a little bit of time off from time to time. Um, so yeah, I want to thank, thank the team, of course, all the participants who are in the um, blood test study too, of course. So for those of you who might be thinking how you might be able to help more, well, you can support Brain Healthy Um you can go to this website uh, for the alumni um, and development office, and you can specify any any support that you might want to give to help us. Given that you know research funding for this kind of work is difficult to get, to be honest, so we're 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 just getting along actually with our work. Um, so you can specify that work goes to the national effort, and the Alterio Brain Project for Alzheimer's Research at Otago, and you can be assured that 100% of your donation directed, or you can contact the development office by email and, and talk through us as you wish, as you, as you may wish. So with that, I think I'll stop. Um, I've probably said enough. I'm very happy to answer questions. I hope you feel that actually there is hope, despite the extreme challenge of any brain disease, actually, and, neuro and Alzheimer's disease in particular, I suppose, but they're all difficult ones. Uh, but we are making progress even here at Otago, just as there's progress elsewhere in the world. But we have, we think we have some unique ideas that actually make, may take us quite a ways. So thank you very much for your attention and um, look forward to hearing what you all think and what questions you might have. Thank you, Cliff. That was um, it's fascinating, quite interesting, the um, extent of which we can um, go to provide some 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 results really so um how long do you think it would take for gene therapy to be an alternative um um you know um option viable option to fight alzheimer's and just sorry just before we answer questions reminder anyone here if you'd like to ask a question please type it into the q a button at the bottom and then uh we, we can ask the question of cliff thank you um so it, it's a good question, and it's a little bit outside my comfort zone because I've never mm -hmm. been involved in any uh, commercial activity or trials myself. But um, I think the first thing we have to do is um, this complete this study that we've just started with the new virus capsid that we know works in primates. Mm -hmm. So if we get good results with that, then I think we'll get a lot of interest from um, various companies to help us um, push that out into some kind of clinical trial. There are gene therapies for other things, other diseases around. Mm. Um, and um, so there is, there are pathways, mm. um, but um, we're in, we're in contact with Otago Innovation and with the, you know, getting advice on um, how to, how to navigate that, that system going out and trying to get either a patent or um, some other way forward to kind of test the gene therapy. Mm. But it's, um, you know, it's, it's not trivial in the sense that you are changing the way in which brain cells operate. Mm. Um, so you want to make sure that you only really do it for mm. people who have clearly have the disease, but not so far along that you've got too much damage already. And that's where having a good screening test is also important. Mm. So I don't want to put years on it, but I'd like to think that, uh, yeah, I don't think I should put years on it, but it's not in the immediate future, right. but I'd like to think that it's not in the distance future either. I mm. think all going well, you know. Yeah, 
it's a few years away. But. Okay. What about cliff fat blood tests? The blood tests that you can take that shows you're predisposed to getting Alzheimer's. Um, it's readily available in other countries. Is that something you can get here in New Zealand? Well, um, the, there are blood tests that have been licensed. Right. Um, there is, you might say, academic debate about how good they are. Okay. So I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any um, commercially or clinically available blood tests mm -hmm. that are being used in New Zealand. But having said that, I'm not a clinician myself, yeah. and so yeah. I may not know all the all the story. Okay. Um, but there's, um, yeah, I, I think there's a bit of development work still to be done uh, mm -hmm. that we're trying to find support for for our test. Yeah, and uh, really, it comes down to matching up against these tests. The thing is, the thing is this: these tests are not 100% perfect. So even if you got a result on the test, you're not necessarily in the clear, or you're and you're not necessarily, you know, um, you might have the disease. But if it shows signs that you might have the disease, it would give give you um, the clinic your clinicians the directive to kind of explore this further for you, mm -hmm. and to try to get al alternative methods uh, to confirm a diagnosis. I don't think they you wouldn't want to use these um, blood tests alone. To, to give you a diagnosis. They're not 100%. Yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, we do have some questions here. So how important are modifiable risk factors? Uh, well, they're very important. And in fact, um, I've just spoken about quite a few. And we spoke mm -hmm. about um, all these um, health, uh, healthy ways of living and, um, and being, and from both diet, exercise, social connections mm. and so forth these are all these are all mod modifiable um, risk factors such as um, cardiovascular problems through because of smoking for other issues mm -hmm. like diabetes these things if they are controlled or you stop smoking these are very important and in fact there's been quite a bit of research in several western countries that over the over the last 10 20 years the incidence of Alzheimer's disease has been going down in terms of at a given age, how mm. much of the population is actually showing Alzheimer's disease. Um, so probably there's a lot of self-medication going on through healthy lifestyle interventions, better health care, better education. Um, so that's a positive. On the other hand, there's some evidence that that might be beginning to reverse because of um, I think there's a lot of um, obesity coming online that didn't used to be there, for example, and other things that are actually on the rise. Mm. So there's a there's sort of conflicting pieces of information, but, but there's no doubt that, um, uh, well, when I say no doubt, the evidence is pointing to uh, a very large, important, uh, that, that um, modif dealing with your modifiable risk factors is hugely important for mm -hmm. at least pushing out the onset of your cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's going to just, as we are trying to do, add life to your years. Hmm. OK. Uh, another question here. Do the activated uh, microglia produce factors that affect the disease? Yes, they do. Um, and like I say, they produce these factors because they're trying to deal with the disease. So we have a combination of what we call pro-inflammatory molecules and anti-inflammatory molecules and they can produce both and some of the same molecules can do both things so it's a matter of how much and for how long mm. and so this is one of the when this is one of the big things that um, is con contributing greatly the neuroinflammation is contributing greatly to disease amplifying what other problems the brain has whether it's the blood supply is not good enough you have too many plaques or whatever mm -hmm. um, when the when the microglia are releasing their cytokines, as they're called, or other factors, um, when they're doing it for too long a period of time, they actually turn into pro-inflammatory and aggravate the disease. So you know you need to have the microglia because uh, in, in normal kind of shorter-term disease conditions or injury conditions, they do a great job. Um, but uh, when they're chronically activated, then it becomes an issue. And this will be true for other parts of the body. You're probably aware that if you have chronic chronic inflammation in various tissues in the rest of your body, that's a bad thing rather mm -hmm. than a good thing. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, there's a question about how specific is this treatment? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure which treatment. Might it be useful for other neurological diseases such as Parkinson's? Yeah, good question. The uh, This therapeutic protein, and you'll notice I haven't given you the exact name of the protein mm. for particular reasons, but um, actually, yeah. so I mean, I probably could, but I'm just being a bit cautious here um, for uh, other reasons. But but yes, we think that this protein, and there have been some studies to say that this protein can actually be helpful for other brain disorders. For example, um, for helping treat stroke, for helping uh, treat head injuries, um, Parkinson's disease, maybe. Um, we haven't really tested it um, in that, uh, and no one, no one has, to my knowledge, have tested it in that sense, but maybe other things like frontotemporal dementia and other forms of um, uh, brain dysfunction. So yeah, I think this is a, this is a treatment to increase brain resilience. Mm -hmm. And we don't think, um, of course it takes the evidence to show, but we don't think it's specific to Alzheimer's disease, mm -hmm. that it will be something that could be useful for other disorders as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good, that's good to hear. Okay, another question. Does your wonderful neuroprotective molecule reduce neuroinflammation associated with the disease? Yeah, that's something we are um, currently um, investigating. So um, interestingly, when we did the studies in the, uh, with the injections directly into the hippocampus, they improved memory, they improved brain plasticity, but they didn't reduce plaques or reduce the neuroinflammation. So Again, this is a matter of making um, making the brain more resilient uh, to these to the pathology. But the studies that were done with the uh, peripheral injections into the tail vein um, are showing signs of actually reducing the inflammation as well as the plaques, which would not be surprising because they sort of go hand in hand. Um, but we're still analyzing that tissue. This is really stuff that's hot off the press. So um, we don't have a complete answer to that yet but um, it's looking promising in this regard so far. Okay, great. Another question, do non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have any impact on the disease? Yes, that's a good question. And that's been around for a while, actually. Um, they've been trialed um, quite a bit because as you might uh, think that, you know, you can infer from the question that here's a way of potentially controlling uh, inflammation. Um, and I think the evidence has been too ambiguous to say that there, it's actually a positive thing. So um, it's not currently recommended. It's not been improved, approved from, by the FDA, for example, for treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so while there may be some benefit, um, um, the problem with the general anti-inflammatories is, is that, um, you know, you do, you do need to have some um, inflammatory response for just normal healthy brain operations and sort of normal conditions. So if you over, you can overdo it potentially and, uh, and you lose the positive functions of these immune cells. Um, and so it's, it's a balancing act. So a, a generalized anti-inflammatory may not be the right approach. Okay, good. Um, okay, quite a, a clinical question here. The amyloid beta hypothesis has been researched for many years and with many clinical trials not having seen benefit from targeting the amyloid beta better. Do you still think the amyloid hypothesis holds value or should we move to other avenues for research? Right, I guess it's how you, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very topical question as probably the person asking the question knows. Um, it's a very uh, uh, well debated topic just at the moment. And I think um, I think the, the answer is that amyloid beta is a part of the disease. There's no doubt about that, I think, but it may not be, and it's probably not the trigger as it were, something has to trigger the amyloid plaque development. And that's really where we need to be looking. And there's various hypotheses about how that works. Um, the uh, amyloid, the anti-amyloid strategies um, may not be working as well as we like because they're, they're probably being given too late in the disease. Um, they have some side effects, unfortunately. Um, and 
it may just not be the right strategy. These antibody strategies may not be the right ones. And in some ways, that's why we've gone away from trying to target the amyloid plaques directly, but instead it just increasing a general um, neuroprotective protein so that it's almost doesn't matter what the actual source of the disease is. Um, we can make the brain more resilient to the pathology. So I think it's, I think, I don't think we need to just say plaques have nothing to do with the disease. Um, but to say that they're the primary cause is probably um, not looking at it the right way either. Hopefully okay. that answers the question for the- Okay, person. great. All right, we've got time for one last question. And the question is, is would the treatment have application for vascular dementia? Uh, my prediction would be yes, for the reasons I've just been um, suggesting mm -hmm. that we think it's a brain resilience um, mm -hmm. Uh, neuroprotection that we're we're providing. Um, I'm not saying that, and I hope what I want to make clear is, and I'm not saying this is going to be a cure for these diseases because they're not directly targeting the disease mechanisms, mm. but it's making the brain more resilient to a variety, potentially a variety of different uh, disorders. Mm. So um, basically, delaying how long it takes for a disease to develop before you sort of go past the tipping point. Um, and it might be quite a long time. We don't know, um, but it it um, it it's an empirical question, and you know, and it, uh, it would take doing these preclinical studies in in models of of um, of these different diseases to really answer the question. So um, yeah, more work, more people, more money. We can we can get we can ask that question. Yeah, great. Lovely. Okay, well, I've just had the well, last one comment was great talk. Thanks, Cliff. So I just want to echo that. So I want to thank you very much, Cliff, for a wonderful presentation. A lot of food for thought. Um, obviously, a lot of things that you can do as a person to um, help, you know, prevent um, this as long, along with a whole lot of other diseases. Just a reminder, we will have a copy of this presentation available as a recording. And my team will send that out to people who are registered for this talk. But once again, I thank you so much, Cliff, uh, for your time and your expertise and for a very, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks. And thanks to everyone who turned up. It's, um, it's great to have an audience and to share what we've been doing, which is pretty exciting. So thank you. OK. All right. And don't forget, if you'd like to support Cliff, please, um, there's a donation link on that because, yeah, as he said, research funding in New Zealand is, is a bit hard to find. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.